Hello, everyone, and welcome to my show on the murder of Marilyn Shepard. This is, hmm, is her husband, Sam Shepard, is he an innocent victim or is he a killer husband? And this has been, a, oh my gosh, a bone of contention over decades. Uh, there have been more than, let's see, I think at least four or five books written about the case. There have been oh, quite the fugitive that was done about the case. Um <laughs> And we have so many pages on YouTube and on the web all about this case. And people are saying, this guy is still guilty. This guy, Eberling, we think he's guilty. Or could it be someone else? But who actually murdered Marilyn Shepard? All right. So I want to welcome back, by the way, <laughs> all the folks who are here with me. Uh, this is actually this take two of this show because there, were, there was technical problems. So I've changed browsers and I'm hoping that this comes in uh, clearly this time. So I'm redoing redoing the beginning of the show. So everybody, does it look good? Oh, good and clear. Okay, I'm not going to say hello to you all again because I already did. <laughs> but if you would like, if you would like to be in the chat room with all these wonderful people, please do join Patreon. Five bucks a month. You can come to eight live shows. Five dollars a month supports a very educational channel. Um, and uh, yeah. You can be here for the live shows. All my shows do go public after I finish the lives. Um, but I like having Patreon patrons from Patreon for my lives because it keeps our, our group small and people focused on uh, crime solving and not just everyone out to say their piece. So not that I don't love all of you. But anyway, <laughs> please do subscribe to the channel. Check my playlist. Hit the bell for, uh, for notifications. And ah, okay, that's enough of that because I already did that before I had to change <laughs> and redo the show. All right, so um, now when I left off, I had done a Wikipedia version of what this, this case is about. Um, but I did mention to you that a lot of people who, who are writing about the case do it in a very fictionalized form. And a lot of times the information isn't exactly correct. And I was looking for one of these examples um, and I found it. And now it's, this is from a book called Bodies of Evidence by Dr. Scott Christensen. Okay. And here it's the title here is uh, about blood spatter and, and, and shepherd. Uh, and the subtitle is a brilliant criminalist devises new techniques to follow the killer's bloody trail and helps to free Sam Shepard. That's not exactly true. Again, this is, this is exaggerated. Um, and I'll get into that during the show. Okay, here's his, here's his take on it. And you can get a basic idea of what happened back in, in 1954. So I'm going to use this instead of Wikipedia. The blood was everywhere. Actually, not everywhere. Mostly in the bedroom. <laughs> Police arrived at the physician's Bay Village, Ohio home, early on July 4th, 1954, to find Mrs. Marilyn Shepard in the upstairs master bedroom. Her body was lying in her bed in a pool of blood. This is true. Her head battered by more than 15 blows. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, some people say 35, and that's not accurate. She had about a dozen, uh, yeah, about 15, 13, 14, 15 blows to her head, but some of them were to her nose, her mouth, and then the other damage was to her shoulders and to her hands. And so that's where 35 comes from. Um, a pillow uh, by an unidentified heavy object. That is true. How heavy the object was is also in question. And I will give you a, a visual of that a little later. A pillow on the bed showed a three inch long blood stain. Uh, the walls of the master bedroom were spattered with blood. A trail of blood led down the stairs and onto the terrace. Dr. Sam Shepard, husband of the deceased. That's Sam Shepard. Uh, he's a, he's a, um, a surgeon, by the way. His face swollen and one of his vertebrae fractured. Not necessarily so. There was damage on his face. Uh, how the fracture issue is really questionable. <laughs> and he seemed disoriented from his ordeal. All right. But there were no, there was no cut. That's true. He didn't have any, he didn't have any cuts to himself. Um, and there was, there were no blood spots on him. Well, he wasn't wearing a shirt. So if there were blood spots on a shirt, the shirt was now missing. Um, he was wearing a pair of trousers and there was blood on the left knee of the trouser 
a kind of diluted blood. And we'll get to that later. So not entirely true. He told the cops a harrowing story of how the previous night, his wife's screams had awakened him from his sleep on the downstairs day bed. Now, what had happened there was he and his wife had had friends over, a couple that they knew very well, and they'd watched a movie and supposedly he fell asleep on the day bed because, you know, <laughs> sometimes men do that. <laughs> I'm joking because my ex-husband used to do that. <laughs> He'd fall asleep during any movie. And then Marilyn led the couple out and he was asleep on the day bed. Now, from that point on, we do not know exactly what happened because he was asleep on the day bed when they left. But when Marilyn came back in, the what he is saying is that he continued to sleep on the day bed. Therefore, Marilyn must have gone upstairs and she was attacked and her screams woke him. And then he went upstairs. We do not know that is true. Just to point this out, um, because as we're going to look at this case, we're going to find there's a lot of conflicting information. So there's a lot of scenarios, a lot of experts disagreeing with each other. And sometimes some of the some of the claims are just kind of crazy. Um, and so I'm going to try to look at this as the evidence that I see and what it means. But we do not know that when she came back in, that he remained asleep on the day bed. He might have. So we don't know. He could have done that. Or she could have said, hey, let's go upstairs to bed. And they walked upstairs to bed. We don't know if that's not true. We don't know if they had an argument downstairs and a fight ensued on the way upstairs. We don't know. All we have is his word that he was asleep on the day bed and he didn't wake up until he heard his wife screaming his name, supposedly, Sam, Sam, and in desperation. That's what he says. All right. He rushed upstairs. I'm going to read you in a little bit about this is where fictionalization comes in from these people writing books. So when people write books, the problem is we assume that they're going with exact facts, but a lot of times they are not. He did not rush upstairs. In his own words, he didn't even rush upstairs. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't go upstairs. I'm just saying that this is exaggerated and not true, and it might have a bearing on this case. He had rushed upstairs and entered the bedroom where he was struck on the head from behind. Okay, so we'll get to that. When he came to, he found his wife dead and panicked about their son, Sam, age seven, who was sleeping in the next room. The, then he realized the intruder was still in the house. Okay, first of all, what he originally said, and I want to point this out, was that when he came upstairs, he saw a white biped form, which was a really weird way of saying that. But he has some weird... He has some weird descriptive things. You know, we're a white biped form. I want to point out the white part um, because that to me is interesting. He was able to see this person. Uh, there was no light on in the room, so he claims. Um, where he got any light to see anything is questionable. I can't seem to find that info. But he saw a white form in front of him, which means the person, in my opinion, who he's looking at was wearing white. And that will play a part in my analysis. So keep that in mind. Um, he, he later claimed he was hit in the back of the head while he was grappling with this guy. So it's like, and then he said, maybe there's two guys. So we'll get to that later too. Um, but then he supposedly doesn't say here, he heard noises downstairs. Then he realized an intruder was still in his house. So he gave chase. So he goes downstairs, sees the guy, chases the guy out onto the beach along Lake Erie. He caught a man and fought him, but the man knocked him out again. That's what he does claim or, or choked him out. He described this stranger as tall with a large head and bushy hair and supposedly not included here as he's seen black. So if he saw white upstairs, now he's seeing black on the beach. So that's where maybe it's two guys. All right. The detectives didn't believe Shepard's story, especially when they caught him in a lie. Upon learning that he had tried to conceal from them his adulterous affair with a medical technician, they considered, himself the, considered him the prime suspect. Word went out that Shepard had cheated on his pregnant wife and then killed her during a fight over his infidelity. Now, word went out because there's no proof that he killed her because she found out about his infidelity. That's, 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 that is a, that is a theory. Okay. Understand the difference between proof and a theory. So the police had a theory because he was cheating on her, which seemed to be true. Um, they had some issues in their marriage, although their son, when he grew up, said they, he had the most idyllic life. He was seven when they uh, when his mom died and his father got ended up in prison. But he was had an idyllic life. His parents were absolutely perfectly happy. 
I'm sorry, dude, you're seven years old. And I can't remember anything from beyond below seven years old, except I have like three memories. <laughs> I do not have a clue what my parents were like. Just, just to be truthful. You know, um, I remember, I remember walking to school. I have one vision of walking to school. I have a vision of being at my friend Laura's house. Um, I don't have a clue if my parents were happy or if they argued or if they were loving even. I, I have no memory of them at all. Sad. And probably my granddaughter will have no memory of me and my kids probably have no memory of how they were below seven either. That's the way life goes. So oh, I want to point this. Okay, I'm going to have to jump here to Stephanie. Stephanie said, why would you wear white to break into a house to kill someone at nighttime? I was going to get to that later, Stephanie, but that's my problem. That is very bizarre. Now, the only one who was, the one we know who was wearing white was Marilyn. Their clothing was, was, was whitish. But I th thought the same thing. Immediately that struck me. Now, sometimes when you're analyzing crime, things will pop up right away, red flags, and you go, that doesn't make sense. Now, mind you, you have to be careful because in the long run, it's going to be the totality of the evidence. So we can't say, oh, he's guilty because he said he saw somebody white and white and the only person was her. So he must have seen her and not a killer. We can't say that, but we can question it, <laughs> that it seems odd that a burglar or a serial killer or both would come into the house in bright clothing that could be seen. It's a little bit odd. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Um, uh, uh, I want to, Stephanie also says the off language to describe the crime is awfully Jeffrey McDonald too. They're both, they both are very interested in speaking in a style that they think makes them look smarter than others. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, I'm going to get into uh, some statement analysis in a minute. Um, uh, so I'm going to go there in a bit. Let's see. Um, Oh, Stephanie's back again. Stephanie, I'm not picking you out specifically, but your your, your comments are, ca are catching me. Um, lots of people claim the fractured vertebrae is the evidence he was attacked by another intruder. Easily could have been injured in a fight with his wife. Yes, and the the, the problem with the, the vertebrae thing is that his own brother <laughs> was a doctor, and his own brother was the one who said he had that, and there was a whole bunch of issues over there. Any x-ray really proved any of that? What, what interests me is that he ended up with, uh, let me show you the collar he ends up with. So they do take his take him to the hospital, right? And he ends up looking like this. Um, okay, so here he is in, in the collar, which once you start complaining of neck pain, that's what you do. But mind you, at this point, he has grappled with a man in his, in, in, in his, in he and his wife's bedroom, grappled and been knocked out. Then he's run down the stairs and then he's run down more stairs to the beach. And then he's grappled with a guy on the beach and he gets knocked out again. That's a hell of a lot to do with a broken neck. <laughs> That's a lot. Now, could he have a minor fracture? Sure. What did that minor fracture come from? Don't know. Um, it, could it come from an, an intruder? Yes, it can. If the intruder did something to him, hit him in the back of the neck. Absolutely. Could it come if he had actually fought his wife? Could she have hit him with something? Absolutely. People don't think of this. Could he have hit himself? People often don't think about that. But, you know, let's say you're swinging something that's long. We don't know what the weapon is. We've never learned this. I'm going to go into the weapon later. You got this big weapon and you whack your wife with it. And then you come back. You can hit your own self with the, think of a tire iron. You can whack yourself with a tire iron and fracture your own neck. <laughs> so these are things to keep in mind. When somebody jumps to something and says, oh, this is obviously what happened. And this is a case where things aren't terribly obvious. Um, let's see. Um, uh, this is a good question, Lauren. Why would he say he saw somebody in white? Uh, my guess is because he saw somebody in white. And, and you're asking this question. Is there some reason that saying this would help him? No. It actually would not help him, okay? Um, but why would he say that? Well, I'm 
what's here's a weird thing that happens, and I'm not, I'm, I'm only in the beginning of this case of discussing what I think could have happened and all this stuff. But one of the things that does happen when people are telling a version of whatever they want to tell you is that let's say they're lying. Okay. Let's, it, it, it's very hard to lie and use a completely imaginary scenario that has no connection to what happened. This is just human nature. So it'll, let's say, for example, a fellow comes home and his wife says, you smell like perfume and isn't that lipstick on your shirt? <laughs> Where were you for the last three hours? And he's got to come up with something. And in his mind, let's say he's where he was, was in a motel with a secretary and they were getting it on. Now he's got a problem. So what he does is he remembers parts of what happened and then he moves them into another scenario because that's a vision he has. He can't get rid of it. So if he thinks of, let's say she, she, the, she, they were grappling. <laughs> let's say they were grappling in a motel bed. Then what he'll say is, oh, I was leaving work and she hugged me because he's got to get somebody close enough to put the perfume on him. But he still remembers the hugging, grappling part. <laughs> uh, and then if there's lipstick there, he could go, um, uh, I patted her on the head and her lipstick got on me. He's got, but he, but he remembers he was rolling around with her like this, you know, but so you take part of reality and you move it into a new story. So that often happens when people are trying to create, they have trouble creating from absolutely nothing. So they create from something. They just change the circumstances slightly. So could that be what happened? He either saw somebody in white. Some guy came into his house dressed in, uh, it's near a beach. He came in with a beach shirt on. <laughs> it was a white beach shirt. Or he's just looking at his wife who's in a white pajama. I don't know which one is it. Um, Lauren says, or he saw the window cleaner wear white previously. Now that's an interesting, <laughs> an interesting concept there, uh, because your point, uh, we're, we're talking about Eberlin. Um, he's the number one other suspect. Um, did he wear white sometimes? And therefore, yeah, I mean, he either saw him because he's a, he is a major suspect. He is the number one other suspect. Did Eberling actually come into the house wearing white? Maybe because he's a dope. You know, and here's another problem we run into. We expect all people who commit crimes to commit crimes intelligently. <laughs> when in fact, a lot of them are idiots. <laughs> so yes, would I expect a burglar or a serial killer to be wearing dark clothes? Absolutely. You're coming into the night, you do not want to be seen. You're going to slither through and you want dark clothing. Almost always that's true. But could you have an idiot? You could, in which case you have to take that into account. So either, yes, he could have remembered that Eberling. I'd, Eberling was never his suspect, by the way. He was in court. Eberling actually testified in court and he never said a thing. He never suspected Eberling of killing his wife, which is very interesting to me because he grappled with, he supposedly grappled with some the guy in the room. You would think if he can see enough at all, he might recognize him um, or at least might suspect him, but he never did. So I, I think that probably didn't happen. Um, now, one of the other things, uh, oh, how does he know there aren't true intruders? He claimed it could be one intruder. Then he said it could be two intruders. And the reason he said that was because at a point he was saying he was grappling with a guy and he got hit in the back of the head. That would in indicate two people, right? Also, he saw white upstairs in the guy's clothing. And by the beach, he saw black clothing. So... According to him, it would be two people. And that kind of, in my opinion, and, and there, there would be two men, by the way. And I want you to keep the two men in mind because F. Lee Bailey comes along in the second trial and tries to claim a, the friends that were at their house, uh, male, female, they were the ones who killed Marilyn. And the female was the one that, that beat Marilyn to death. And, and her husband just went, okay, honey, go for it. 
<laughs> so, but it, it makes no sense that, you know, if he's grappling and some with somebody is grappling, I don't think it's going to be a, a middle-aged woman. You know what I mean? So it's either one man or two men. Eberling, did he have a buddy that he ever worked with? Not that I ever heard of. So we're going to get into all of that in a, in, in a bit because it's so fascinating. I mean, it really is. Um, oh, mm, glad you brought up that Waltzing Matilda. What are the odds that a big athletic footballer, he was a football player, he was very large. A shepherd confronted the assailant twice and got knocked unconscious both times, once in the home and once at the lake. This has been the prosecution's argument. This dude is not small. Um, now, there's an interesting problem here, which I run into. The prosecution claims that they think this is one of their story that he was he, he was drunk that he you know after they were hanging out together I can't get any I guess there was no alcohol level done back then so I don't know if he was drunk and he doesn't say he was drunk so this is really interesting so he's lying on the the he's down in the day bed and and his wife is upstairs when he hears her shout Sam Sam and then he comes up, get, gets off the day bit. Now, the prosecution says he had had too much alcohol and when he went upstairs and she wouldn't have sex with him, he, he's, he got pissed off at her and and beat her to death. That's the second, that's another, mind you, there's two here. One is she found about uh, out about his infidelity and so he beat her to death. Second one was she wouldn't have sex with him, so he beat her to death. And I could throw in a third one that she wanted a divorce and he was pissed off at her or she was four months pregnant. He wasn't sure the kid was his. And there's like <laughs> a whole bunch of why he beat her to death. All right. We don't know, have a clue. Uh, if that were true, we have no clue. The why is out there, but the alcohol thing, there's two possibilities here. One is he drank a lot and in the drunken state, he lost control of himself or two in a drunken state. He, heard her voice, went upstairs, wasn't totally together, and everything is a blur for him because he's drunk. What bothers me is that he never says that. You know, if, in his own defense, he should say, man, I was so damn drunk. <laughs> when I went, that's, that's why I couldn't fight. That's why I couldn't see straight. That's why I didn't know what the hell was going on. That's why I'm blurry. He never says that. At least I haven't found that. And that would be a number one defense I would go with if, you know, regardless but he never says that. So I have a feeling he wasn't that drunk. Um, uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Yes, this was brought up. Why would an intruder pulverize Marilyn with a weapon, but then take on a much larger shepherd with his bare hands? The claim shepherd made. Uh, <laughs> okay. This is where the story changes. One, the shepherd claimed he got punched and the punch knocked him out. And there are people who have been in boxing who say, oh, hell no. That, that one punch is not going to knock you out. Might knock you down, but it's not going to knock you out. Not, not here. Now, uh, a chin punch, well, I can do you in, but not here. So then he said somebody hit him on the back of the head. So there's where your two guys come in and the fractured neck comes in and why he was knocked out. It's all... A little strange. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, perhaps after his, his booze nap on the day bed, he went to the bedroom wanting intimacy. Perhaps she rebuffed him and he lost it. Perhaps an argument ensued over the baby or over his infidelity or all of the above. Yeah, we don't know. So we can't, as far as motive goes, it kind of sucks. I mean, was he a cheater? Yes. Was there issues of whether they were going to get divorced and her issues over how happy she was with him? Yes. Like Jeffrey McDonald. Jeffrey McDonald to me was a little more obvious as far as why he might want to knock off his wife. He's a little more blurry about that, but yeah. Okay. Now what I want to go to, or I want to go to his statement in court first, a statement analysis version. And then I'm going to go to the DNA because the DNA issue is what blew up this whole case. And then I want to go to the alternate suspects. And I want to talk about, is this the guy that could have done it? 
Is there another guy who could have done it? And if it was another guy, how did he do it? All right. I'm going to end with how did he do it? If I forget, tell me. <laughs> There's so much information. All right. I want to read to you. His. OK, first, I want to point out to you a couple things. This is from Peter Hyatt, who I highly respect. Um, Peter and I have known each other for a long time, and I like some of the things he says. Pay attention to this concept. OK, this was written about Tiffany uh, uh, Hartley, uh, both 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 uh, Peter and I think Tiffany Hartley. Who, she was one who was on the, the Texas border on a lake with her husband on some ski uh, jet skis. He gets killed and disappears with a jet ski. And she says, oh, you know, she 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 out, she she tried to save him and then she outran the, 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 the cartel, which neither neither one of us, Peter and I believe that. Um, but this is what he said. A, begin where her priority is. So he's looking at her her um, statements. What is her priority? Let her choose her own words, okay? So don't guide her. Let her choose her own words to include the information she deems important. All right. When a person gives a statement right up front and often in many of the statements, they will show you what their priority is, okay? Why are they telling you this stuff? Is it because this is just factual? Or are they trying to explain why certain things happen? Are they trying to defend themselves? What is their issue? And this is another thing P Peter Hyatt says. We note that whenever an account has so, since, therefore, because, it is noted as sensitive since the subject is no longer simply telling what happened, but why something happened. This indicates sensitivity as a subject feels a need to explain actions. And this whole thing about explaining actions, oh, my Lord. Is that in his statement? Now, I'm going to go to his court statement, which is interesting because he's had a whole heck of a lot of time to think about what he's going to say. OK, he's been probably actually uh, uh, coached by his defense team. And this is what he comes up with in court. And I find this just fascinating. All right. Um, let me find it. Okay. All right. This is the select. This is testimony of Sam Shepard in his 1954 murder trial. Oh, by the way, I want to point out there are three basic trials here. The first trial, he was he was convicted. The second trial was when F. Lee Bailey came in. You know, the famous F. Lee Bailey, O.J. He came in and took some of the most ridiculous stuff I've ever heard, and he was found not guilty. Some people say he was exonerated. Wikipedia says he was exonerated. That's not exonerated. Being found not guilty is not exonerated. It just means the jury found you not guilty based on what they heard. Um, and then the third trial was a civil trial brought on by his son, and uh, they, he, he lost that trial. A lot of DNA evidence was entered there, but against the state of Ohio for wrongful imprisonment, and he lost. But, okay, this is from the first trial. Now listen to the words. Okay, the first thing I can recall was hearing Marilyn cry out my name once or twice. Which was it? Once or twice. Which was followed by moans, loud moans, and noises of some sort. This is what you call excessive description. <laughs> I was awakened by her cries. What is the most important thing he's got to say? I was awakened. Because he's got to be downstairs. And she's got to be calling for him. So her screaming is not good enough. She has to call, Sam, Sam, like she wants his help. Because if she just screams, he could be killing her, right? But if you say Sam, Sam, and he's down there totally asleep, he's 100% completely innocent right there and then. I was awakened by her cries. And in my drowsy recollection, drowsy recollection. Okay, I'm sorry, but... um. Maybe I'm unusual, but if I hear somebody screaming, Pat, Pat, I don't have a drowsy recollection. I wake up and I'm like, what the heck? And I'm, I'm there, especially because now I, there's something happening. I'm alert as all get out. Why am I having a drowsy recollection? Now, I might have a drowsy recollection if 
I don't care. I'm just sleeping. And somebody's like, Pat, <laughs> I'm like, oh, whatever. But somebody's screaming, Pat, Pat. Or my, my daughter's calling, Mom, Mom. Or my granddaughter's saying, Grandma, Grandma. I'm going to be awake just like that because that's shocking. There should be no drowsy involved. But he, and he's not saying he's drunk. He's saying he's drowsy. Excuse me, you're a doctor. <laughs> Here's where I, this is where I lose it right here. You're a doctor. People call him in the night because he's a surgeon and need emergency stuff. Now, I, in my life, I have been a sign language interpreter. I was a medical sign language interpreter. I was on call 24-7. Let me tell you, if you're on call 24-7, you know how to wake up in exactly two seconds. Because back in the old days, I used to get a page. And the page would go beep or whatever it did. And I jumped like this and I would immediately make the phone call. What do you need? Later on, I got a text message coming in on my phone and it would come in and go, Pat, we want you at GW Hospital in DC ASAP. And I would write, I would type on the way. And that would be it. Do you know I was out of the house in five minutes? I jumped up, I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, threw my hair in a ponytail, chucked on whatever, and was out the door in my car. Five minutes. Okay, maybe six. But I didn't drowsily. Oh, I've got a text message. Let me see if I can get to it. I would lose my job. There's a surgeon on call stuff. I don't believe a minute of it. Drowsy? Mm, I'm, I'm having issues with that. All right. My drowsy rec rec recollection. Stimulated, stimulated to go to Maryland which I did as soon as I could navigate. Now, here, here again, there's two things that are just off the wall. Stimulated. So her cry stimulated him out of his drowsiness. Stimulated. Not frightened him. Not, not scared him. Stimulated him. Uh, and he went, uh, did so as soon as he could navigate. He didn't navigate it right away. It took him a while to navigate. Why is that? Why is he taking so long to go up those darn stairs? All right. Then they question him. Now, just one question here. Do you have a thought in your mind at that time as to what caused Marilyn to cry out? His answer was this. My subconscious feeling. Subconscious? Why isn't it a conscious feeling? I mean, subconscious? And it's not a feeling. It's your belief was that Marilyn was experiencing one of the convulsions she had experienced early in pregnancy. I'd like to know the validity of that. She had convulsions. She was four months pregnant. Why would she be having convulsions? And I ascended the stairway, ascended, not ran up the stairs. Remember the guy in the beginning? He rushed. No, he didn't rush. He ascended. It's like going to heaven. <laughs> I ascended to heaven. What the heck? As I went upstairs, and again, he repeats it. So one of the problems when people repeat things over and over again, it's like this slow motion movie that they're, they're, they're creating. As I went upstairs and into the room, I felt that I could, I felt that I could visualize a form of some type with a light top. Okay, wait a minute. I saw a person with a light top. When I came up the stairs, I saw a person with a light top. That's what happened. But no, that's not what happened. He felt. Why do you feel something? You don't feel you see something. What the heck are you talking about? I felt I could visualize. You could visualize or you did visualize. What do you mean visualize? You saw or you didn't see. You don't visualize something. This is like a dream in his head. Maybe because it's not true. If you're making up something, you are visualizing. That's called creating. Oh, okay. I visualize a form of some type. What some type? What kind? What's in your, what's, what's going to be in your wife's bedroom? Was it a bear? <laughs> Who's wearing a white top? It's a person. You don't have to visualize a form. It's a person. All right. With a light top. As I tried, tried to go to Maryland. I was intercepted or grappled. Which one was it? It's one or the other. 
as I try to shake loose or strike. Okay, if he's grappling you, you're trying to strike, shake loose. If he's intercepting you, you might be striking. You can't make up your mind which one it is. I have a problem with this. As I try to shake loose or strike, and by the way, the grappling thing is very, very important because I'll be pointing out later on, if he doesn't have blood on him, if this guy's been beating the crap out of his wife and has blood all over him, how is he grappling with the guy? Arms around each other, fighting like a wrestler, which he became later and called himself killer, um, which is a terrible idea if you, <laughs> I mean, why you, would, why you would take that label killer just to make money is kind of creepy. Or did you think it was funny because you were exonerated? Quote, exonerated, not found guilty. But the grappling. Okay, you would have then blood on you. Blood on your hands, blood on your arms, blood of whatever. <sighs> but we're going to get to that part later. Um, he tried to shake loose or strike. I felt that I, I felt again. I felt I was struck from behind. You're not asleep. Okay, you're not asleep. Why do you feel things and not know things? What? I'll, I'll tell you something. I was out feeding the uh, feeding the um, horse, the donkey, and the alpaca in the pasture next to me, which is my daughter's pets. Okay, and the goat. Um, <laughs> and I went in through the gate, and I was get, closing the gate, and I was suddenly struck from behind. Pam! I got, and then I turned around to look. And there was nothing there. Well, apparently I'd, I had hit the electric fence and I, and it felt like a strike from behind. Felt like, <laughs> it felt like a strike from behind because it didn't come from behind. It came from electric fence, but I did turn immediately because I thought it was from behind. But when he says, I felt I was struck from behind. If the guy's in front of you, how do you feel you're struck from behind? You either were struck from behind or you weren't struck from behind. I don't know how the guy in front of you would strike you from behind. Although the other time he said he hit him with a fist. So I, this whole thing is very confusing. All right. And my recollection was cut off. Your recollection? No, your recollection wasn't cut off. You had a recollection until that point. It was even a recollection. That is your claim until that point. And then you were unconscious, supposedly. The next thing I remember was coming to a very vague sensation. Again, vague sensation of in a sitting position. A vague sensation. Why would you have a vague sensation? You woke up, you were sitting. I don't know why you were sitting because you're supposed to be knocked out. So go figure. Right next to Marilyn's bed, facing the hallway, facing south. I recall vaguely recognizing my wallet. Again, vaguely. Why are you vaguely? It's either there, it's not there. You know what your wallet looks like. You're not vaguely. Why are you vaguely recollecting things? You know, if even if you've been unconscious, when you wake up, you see things. <laughs> All right. All right. So then it, I'll get into the wallet later because he, he's really, the wallet is there and he takes it and puts it in his pocket, which I find fascinating because apparently your wife is being killed and your concern is putting your wallet in your pocket. All right. All right. I'm going to skip a bunch of this stuff here. Um, all right. So then, well, I realized I had been hurt. And as I came to some sort of consciousness, there's not a some sort, you're either conscious or you're not. I looked at my wife. What did you see? She was in very bad condition. I, I'm, I'm trying to understand the lighting in the room because you couldn't see the guy. You only saw a white shirt. And I don't know where the lighting is coming from. She had been, she had been badly beaten. I felt that she was gone. He feels again. You felt that she was gone. This is your wife. This is your beloved. This is the mother of your child. I'm not feeling anything. I'm finding out. You're a doctor for God's sakes. You're a guy who knows how to deal with crisis. You just feel things. I felt she was gone. What the hell is that? That's just unbelievable. And I was immediately fearful for Chip, the boy in the next room. So you haven't found out if your wife was dead, but you're worried about your boy in the next room, which is fine, but you haven't found out if your wife is dead. I went down the stairs. Okay, did you check your wife? Did you, I mean, I've worked in a hospital. I can do, a, and I've done crime scene stuff. He's a surgeon. That man is 
sloths. That man has had so much blood on his hands, blood everywhere. He's not afraid of blood. He sees his wife as bloodied. Why would that man not jump up, go to his wife, turn her head, look in her eyes, then check her pulse this way, not do whatever he's got to do and, and look at her and make sure she's, and for God's sakes, if she's not 100% dead, there's a phone on the table. Pick up the phone and call the call for nine, call for an ambulance. Call call for help. But he didn't do that. He feels she was dead. Later he says he did check her pulse. But that is so not normal. And he's not scared of blood. So what the heck is your problem, dude? Um, I felt immediately fearful for Chip. I went into Chip's room, and in some way, some way. Okay, there's only one way. <laughs> Evaluated that he was all right. What was the some way? He listened to his breathing. You said, Chip. And he went, huh? Which one was it? For God's sakes. You're in a situation where you want to know if your son has been murdered. In some way, I evaluated. Evaluated? You don't evaluate whether his son is dead or alive. You find out, for God's sakes. <sighs> I don't know how I did it. Why not? You're conscious or you're unconscious. I'm sorry. I, I, this concept where you had some neck pain and you were you were maybe have a slight concussion doesn't mean you can't do anything. Um, I don't know how I did it. At this time or shortly thereafter, I heard a noise downstairs. Now, mind you, his wife, he, at this point, in this, this version, he hasn't even checked if he's dead. His, his son, he's not sure if he's, how he evaluated him, but he doesn't make a phone call to get help. He hears a noise downstairs. Now, you're upstairs. You are going to, the first thing you're going to do is protect your son. I would lock the doors and call the police. I would get a weapon to, to protect, if anybody's going to come back and try to hurt my son. No, 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 that's not what he does. And what did you do when you heard the noise downstairs? Uh, and I, I can't explain my emotion. Well, we don't care about your emotion. We actually don't. Um, but I was stimulated. Oh, my God. The stimulated word has returned. Oh, Lord God. Um, uh, stimulated. To chase or get whoever or whatever was responsible for what happened. <laughs> Sorry. What? 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 Um, what? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> whoever or whatever. Was it a bear? <laughs> Was it a demon from another world? What the heck is whatever? Now, mind you, this is this is testimony at a trial. This isn't him. He had so much time to figure this out, and he still can't come up with a, a story that makes a, a bit of sense. Um, <laughs> I was stimulated, stimulated again. So he doesn't do things on his own. He's stimulated. Takes away responsibility from himself. To chase or get whoever or whatever was responsible for what had happened. I went down the stairs, went into the living room, over toward the east portion of the living room, and visualized a form. He's visualizing forms again. There's a, you come down, you see somebody. You don't visualize somebody. Now, now where was the form that you first visualized him? Uh, between the front door of the house and the yard somewhere. Okay. Now, are you able to tell the jury what your mental condition was when you came out of this awoke from the attack. Now he is asking for, at this point, he is asking for a mental condition. So if he answers that, I can't entirely say he's wrong in doing so. I was very confused. I might be called punchy in language that we use as slang. I was stimulated again, or driven to try to chase the person. Again, he's taking responsibility away from himself, saying things happen to him without his knowing why he's doing things, which is as unscientific as a doctor could possibly be which I did. And when you saw the form, what did you do? I tried to pursue it as well as I could under the circumstance, it. What do you think it was? And where did you pursue it? Toward the steps to the beach, at which time I lost visualization of this form. Was it dark, beg pardon? Was it dark, dark? Uh, yes, sir, it was dark, but there was enough light from somewhere that I could see this form. Maybe the moon. Uh, yes, all right. I descended the stairway and to the landing, and I visualized the form going down. 
what what's wrong with the word saw i saw the guy at, or down or as he came onto the beach and it was at this time that i felt that i could visualize a silhouette that was describable i uh, what happened on the beach i descended as rapidly as i could i lunged or lurched and grasped this individual from behind now mind you this individual who is all right let's assume this individual this thing, <laughs> it just killed his wife. His adrenaline is flying, all right? He is trying to get the hell out of Dodge. He is running down the steps. He has had a concussion, is, can hardly manage things, right? Somehow he's still able to catch up with it. Now, it is not running far away. It stops on the beach and goes, you coming together? Really? Why isn't the it running away? <laughs> Somehow he manages to catch up with it. And um, let's see. Okay. So now I grasp this individual from behind. Whether I caught up with him or whether he awaited me, I can't say. I'm going to say, you couldn't have caught up with him. I think he would have to be waiting for you, which makes no sense at all. I felt he's feeling again as though I had grasped an immovable object of some type. I was conscious thereafter of only a choking or twisting type of sensation. And that is all I can remember until I came to some sort of very vague, he's vague, he's vague all over the place, sensation in the water, the water's edge. What were you able to determine about that person? How did you know? Hey, 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 lawyer. It's not a person, it's an it. <laughs> yes, were you, yes, I was, yes, sir. And what? I felt... It was a large, relatively large form. <laughs> what is his form issue? You cannot say man. It's not a large form. I'm pretty sure you know what a man feels like and what a man looks like. Why aren't you saying, I saw this guy? A relatively large form. The clothing was dark from behind. There was So now he's not the white guy with a white in the, in the room. And there was evidence of a good-sized head. Evidence. Nice <laughs> evidence of a good-sized head with a bushy appearance on top of the head. Hair. Now then, when you came to the second time, because this guy like, chokes him out or knocks him out or whatever, where were you? I don't know exactly where I was. Were you on the beach? I was on the beach. with. Where was your head and where were your feet? My feet were in the water. My head was directed toward the seawall. I could have been slightly askew. The waves were breaking over me and even moving my lower part of my body. What was the condition of the light? And then he says the light had, the day had broken. Um, he said, my mental condition was I was uh, extremely confused. I did not know where I was, how long I've been there, what my own name was for that matter. Then he gets up on his feet. I remember as I finally came to enough sensation to get to my feet, I rather staggered up the stairway. And as I was going up, or as I was recognizing that this was my house, I entered the house and came to the realization that I had been hurt and that I had been struck by an intruder. And I was then fearful for Marilyn. I thought she knew she was dead. And although I can't say I remember actually seeing her. Okay, so you, what? Okay. He changes the story a lot and then the number of different things he says. Okay, then he goes and sees her, he goes to the room and he says, I saw her, she had been terribly beaten. Did you determine that she was dead? Yes, I thought that I did. You're a doctor. You are a doctor. I'm sorry, but the number one thing you know how to do is determine whether somebody is dead or alive. I was horrified. I was shaken beyond explanation. I felt that maybe I, oh, I love this part. This is really interesting to me. He asked what his feeling was. Okay, so he was giving an explanation, but I find it interesting. I was horrified. I was shaken beyond explanation, and I felt that maybe I'd wake up. Maybe this is all a terrible nightmare or dream, and I'd walked around pace. Is it a nightmare or a dream? When did he wake up to think it might have been a nightmare or a dream? And in my opinion, as a profiler, now I'm going to go into all the other details of this, but you know, if, if he had committed the crime and then realized what he had done, he would like to wake up from it because he would realize, oh, my God, uh, I've just done a horrible thing. I hope this is this is a nightmare. I hope I wake up. That would make more sense than 
what he's saying here. Um, but I, I can, can't say specifically that I did. Oh, let's say, oh, we went to, oh, then he paced. I may have rechecked little chip. Very likely I did, but I can't say specifically that I did. Again, your son is in a house. His mother is murdered. You'd want to take your son in your arms and make sure he was okay. But you don't know if you did it. I may have gone back in to see Marilyn. As I recalled, I could have passed out again. I don't remember, but I was staggered. Finally, I went down the stairs trying to come to some decision, something to do, where to turn. I must, must have. Again, doesn't know that he did. He's making up a story here. He's not saying I paced. He says I must have paced. This is, this is fabricating. And walked around the downstairs trying to shake this thing off. Shake what off? The murder? Or the whole situation? What, what do you, the, the, your confusion? What? Or come to a decision. What decision? Turn yourself in, admit it, call somebody, pretend it didn't, you didn't do it. What is it your decision is going to be? And I thought of a number and called it. What was the number you thought of? I thought that the number was that of Mr. Hauks. I think that's pronounced Hauks. H-O-U-K-S. Hauk is the, is the people that were over there. Do you recall what you said to him over the phone? No, I don't. Where was the telephone? There are two phones downstairs. I'm not positive which one I used. Again, he doesn't know. Do you know how long it was? Do you have any recollection of the time between your telephone call and the appearance of Mr. Hauk? It seemed like a long time, but evidently it was a short time. Uh, so Mr. and Mrs. Hauk came over. He did not call the police. He called his friends, who were later accused of by F. Lee Bailey of being the killers, <laughs> which is another whole story. Okay, so he says finally here, I was walking through the house again while they, he was waiting on them, trying to clear my mind, trying to remember what had happened, trying to remember a description of this individual that I had seen. Now he's not an it. Now he's not a thing. Trying to differentiate whether there were two people or one. In fact, almost thinking there were two. Uh, shortly before the house came, stopped in the kitchen and put my head on the table. And that was the first time I recall realizing or recognizing that I had a very severe pain in my neck. Up to that time, I'd been holding my neck, but didn't I didn't rem I don't remember. And at that time, I felt my neck was injured. Okay, that's his story. So I'm going to look at your comments. I'm going to go to the DNA evidence. Okay. Uh, because that gets fascinating because there are implications of this guy and possibly another person. And then I want to go to how, if this guy is guilty or some other guy is guilty, how they accomplish this crime. But I'll check your 46 comments. <laughs> See what's here. Oh my goodness. All right. Um, yeah, awfully strange and convenient for him to end up in the lake. Um, there's a lot of issues over, oh, by the way, the, the coroner said that she died between three and 4 AM. He made the phone call at 540. Now, later on, of course, I try to say that the coroner was wrong, uh, but there's a lot of time in between when she supposedly died and when he called for help. What happened in all of that time? And two things. One is he could have been completely knocked out twice. So he was unconscious. So that, you know, while he was unconscious, 20, 30 minutes could have gone by. Possible? Yes. Or he was destroying evidence. He was wearing a shirt that was missing. And he says he doesn't know what happened to it. Now, there's two possibilities. Well, one is... He claims that he claims that the killer might have had a use of it. I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then we'd have to take it off of him. Now, if he were lying on the ground uh, unconscious to take the shirt off of him is a lot of work. Um, I doubt that. Now, possibly if they were tussling, he could have grabbed hold of the shirt. You know, sometimes when you tussle and you pull away, it comes over somebody's head. That could have happened. But I do not see the reason why a killer would take the shirt. He just drop it, probably just drop it in the water right there on the beach. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but the shirt vanished. And that the question is, was the reason he was down at the water was to throw the weapon away? Did he take the shirt, tie it around the weapon, and then chuck the weapon as far as he could, maybe walk into the ocean and chuck it as far as he could? Um, there's a lot of time there. Um, did he clean up? 
you know, in the ocean, get rid of every, all the, all the, any kind of blood spatter on him or anything. That's the problem. There's a lot of time spent that's unaccounted for. And the water is an interesting issue. Either he really chased somebody into the water and got knocked out or he went to the water for a reason. So that's a good point. Um, <laughs> Loretta says, sounds like something a ninth grader would come up with in a creative writing assignment. It's very bizarre. Now, I don't know how, now here's an important point. I wish I had information about how bizarre he was prior to this. Now, if he never spoke in this way prior to this, then he's fabricating. If he was a, a strange fellow in his use of the English language prior to this, then maybe it's just him. Okay. I don't know. Um, and that's one of the reasons when you do statement analysis, you have to find out how people speak prior to that. Um, it's a good, it, if you have any way to do that, whether it be writings or uh, some kind of, I don't know, letters or people who are, have been around them and go, oh my God, he always speaks weird like that. You know, um, but it does sound like massive amount of fabrication, which I have a hard time getting away from unless I can have a reason to get away from it. Um, well, to Matilda says, motive for Shepard getting rid of his T-shirt because it was covered with blood spatter. Motive for an assailant taking Shepard's shirt with him, zero. Yeah, I, I, I can't come up with that. Um, yeah, okay. Um, lots of grappling and tussling with the nurse's girlfriend, perhaps, and not the bushy-haired biped killer. <laughs> um, the tussling is interesting because one of the things that will come out later on, do the DNA, is that he has so little blood spatter on him and he is wearing pants i'll get to the pants issue in a minute and the pants have one area of, of a, a weak area of a blood uh that's water's been on it and some blood pattern other than that he's got nothing on his pants if he's tussling two times with a killer wouldn't you think that killer has blood all over him he, he would have his wife at least his wife's blood all over him if not the killers and i'm going to get into what they said the killer's blood was at the scene and not and not his. And that becomes a whole another interesting thing. Um, his shoes and socks were also damp. Was he wearing shoes or socks during his daybed nap? Well, I would say that if he fell asleep on the daybed watching a movie and he had people over, he would be wearing shoes and socks. Yes. However, that doesn't mean that's when everything took place. So did he take the shoes and socks off? Did he take his pants off? And then they were never involved in the scene at all. Then he can always put them back on and go down to the beach and then they're wet. But, uh, you know, there's, it's, un, it's kind of unproven which way it went. Um, uh, Stephanie says, trying to come to some decision. This statement makes me laugh, but really, holy cow, how did he think he was not telling on himself? This was in the trial. This wasn't even the other ones. Uh, again, you can go look up this, his previous statements when you see there's some shade. There's some questionable things there too. But this is, this is during the trial. He's had a lot of time to work on it. You know. Um, let's see what else you have to say. Um, uh, Linda, Linda obviously has made her decision. Don't make a decision yet. I haven't gotten to the DNA and and this guy. Only reason the jerk was near the water was to get rid of a murder weapon. Um, and, and there is an issue over the murder weapon. What the heck was the murder weapon? Now, let me let me show you some things about the murder weapon. Um, the murder weapon is really questionable. Um, hold on a second. Let me find what I do with it. Uh, uh, uh. Hold on. The, the pictures are so tiny. can't figure them out. Um, hold on. I'm going to flash some things on the screen. No, not that one. Not that one. Where is it? Okay. Okay. Here. We'll see it here. Um, that is an actually terrible picture of it. All right. What happened to my table? Oh, man. That's so annoying. Okay. My table disappeared. Um, these are, a, this is what I want to point out as she had a lot of damage to her head. She had a blackened eyes. Her nose was fractured. I can't say they punched her in the eyes because her nose was fractured. It could cause the raccoony thing. Um, two teeth were knocked out of her face. And this is going to be very important. Um, lots of damage to her head. Um, well, I want to talk about the weapon. Now, on, on the table here, which I just completely blew my picture, um, there's a telephone, but there's no lamp. There, there's two beds. And in between is a telephone. And there should be a lamp. And supposedly he had taken that lamp to somebody to fix and put a new cord in. 
And that guy said it, he returned it to him, but the lamp was not there. There was no lamp between the beds. The question is what happened to the lamp? And there was no answer for that. Now, was so the theory was a lamp could have been used as the weapon, which makes sense in this. In, uh, sometimes when you're getting into an argument, you're angry. If, if this was not a, if this was a serial killer came into the house, I doubt he'd use it. Probably brought something with him. And the, the other claim from the defense is the guy brought a flashlight so you could see where he was going. Hmm, okay, that makes sense. And then he nailed it with a flashlight. Good. Um, I, I don't have an objection to that concept. Uh, but what what? But why is the lamp missing? And th th then the question comes into is what kind of lamp could they have the, the killer have used if this was actually Sam who used a lamp? Now, I actually came up with some lamp pictures, um, which I probably lost here. Hold on a second. Ah, where are my lamp pictures? <laughs> Hold on. I lost my lamp pictures. Hold on a second. I may have to go find my lamp pictures. Where'd they go? Okay. This is the picture that never made it here. <laughs> okay, so this is the picture of the two beds. Back in the day, you know, they had this thing, the separate beds. Yeah. Um, and here's the phone, which would be a good thing to smash somebody's head in with. I would go for the phone, but apparently there's no blood on it. Um, and then this little clock here, and the, but there's no lamp. And supposedly, if Sam is on one side, Marilyn's on the other, he gets a phone call in the night to come to the hospital. He might have to turn on the lamp and write something down because we didn't have cell phones, right? You couldn't just do something quietly like this. And he had to have a way to see to be able to write something down. What would he do? Would he get up and cross the room and turn on the whole overhead light? No, he had a lamp. But then the question comes into, I, I looked up some 1950s lamps. Now, here's a lamp. Now, you cannot use that as a weapon because you see most of it's ceramic. So you just smash it one time on her head and then the lamp is, is gone. So that's useless. Now, over here, this is a heavier lamp. Could you pick up this lamp and bash your head in with it? Yes. Um, the biggest issue comes to whether was this, what happens to the lampshade, what happens to the bulb in there? There's no broken glass, okay? So the lap, that part of the lamp wasn't smashed. Now, could you grab this and do this and never break the light bulb? It's possible. So you, these are the things that are very hard to tell. Now, interestingly... One of the things that um, uh, Effley Bailey said was why he thought a woman was involved in this in the second. In the second trial, Effley Bailey comes in and he says the Hawks next door uh, that Marilyn was having an affair with the man and the wife found out, Ms. Houck, Mrs. Hawk found out about it and went over there and, and they went over together for some reason. And then she beat a Marilyn to death. Why? Because she had been struck around 15 times in the head before it killed her. So she must not have been very strong. OK, that's a theory. So she, if, if Marilyn had this, picked this up, she wouldn't have done. I'm sorry if uh, Mrs. Hauke picked this up, she would be hitting Marilyn and wouldn't be hitting very strongly because she's a small woman. So therefore, it's a woman who killed her. Oh, for God's sakes, F. Lee Bailey. This is what I hate about certain defense attorneys. That's just and believe me, it worked because if the, the, the jury went, well, maybe. And they found him not guilty. But that's not the way things work. So the question is, why? If, if a guy hit her that many times or someone hit her that many times and he was the strength of Sam Shepard, what was the problem? Was it because he had, for example, there were some, there were some theories on the weapon and I think I forgot to put that up too. Hold on. Hold on one more second. Things that just don't come over when you send them over. Oh, that I want to grab this one. Now, here's the one I wanted, which didn't make it over. All right, I'm sending it over now, and hopefully it'll show up. 
Um, the problem is there, there was a number of concepts of what the, the weapon could be. All right. And, and if it's, a, if it's a crime of, of pa quote passion or just anger, in my opinion, I don't believe in crimes of passion, but that at that point, let's say Sam got fed up with her. He thought maybe the baby she was pregnant with wasn't his, or maybe he got tired of being married, or maybe she said she was going to drag him through the mud in a, a divorce, whatever the reason is. Um, usually you go for a weapon of opportunity. Okay. And they looked at the different possibilities of weapons. Um, if I can pull this up, if I can locate it now, if it shows up, let's see if it does. <laughs> nope. Ah. I'm going to try in a bit. Okay, so one of the concepts was that he, there was a, a tool that he used in his work, uh, which it's, this is a bad example of it, but it, it had like curved edges and it was a solid metal thing. Um, this is not a heavy weapon. So if a big guy has a smaller weapon and it keeps, ow, that hurts, it keeps whacking you on the head really hard, it can cause damage, but it may take a while. On the other hand, I have this. I can't even lift it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jesus. God almighty. This is, is a is a an antique from my family's collection. This is a German lady, I guess peeling potatoes or something. My God, this thing, I don't know what I'm made out of, but you know, it's as solid as you can get. Even as a female, if I take this. And that's one of the YouTube things where I <laughs> kill myself on screen. If I hit somebody in the head with this, even as a female, I could kill them in one shot because that is, that is one heavy sucker. Okay. So I just broke my table. Oh my God. <laughs> that thing's heavy. Um, so what could he have used if it, if it was Sam Shepard? I would think that if the guy came and used, he would probably use something of his own. So they thought he used a flashlight. I'm going to try again to see if this stuff came in because it's on slow mode. It sometimes takes half an hour for things to come through. Oh, it came through. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So I searched for a tool that he would have used and it would look like this. Now, the other thing they looked at was fireplace tongs, you know, as you pick up the firewood with, because there was a part of the blood spatter pattern on a pillowcase. Let me show you that. That kind of looked like that. Um, and this is the uh, alternate thing. Of, uh, and of course, even if it was a flashlight, an uh, uh, intruder could have had a flashlight, but so could have Sam Shepard, you know. So that isn't proof of anything. Let me show you the, there's a pattern. This is the blood spatter that's on her pillow. And you see this weird pattern here? You see the kind of like, it looks like two, two prongs here. Now, later on, they said this was actually a blood thing that was a was the, the pillowcase twisting and making these patterns. And then this flipped over. So the two came together and it looks, it's a mirror image. And so it really isn't, a, let's see. It really isn't an object like this that he, that he was beating her with. It was just, there's just something on the pillow. So we don't even know if there's any validity in that whatsoever. So that's a problem. Uh, but the, the fireplace things, he they did check out whether he did use those because, let me show you why, that there's a some sense in that. If you look at the house, here we go. This is where he fell asleep. Those stairs are what goes up to the bedroom. You see where his day bed is? What's right here? It's the fireplace. Now, if he was here, let's say they had a fight and he punched her and she ran up the stairs. He gets mad and he goes to the fireplace and he grabs those, 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 those things you pick up the logs with and he runs after her. And he, you know, when she gets to the bed, he throws her on the bed and he's grabbing at her. Um, could he hit her with tongs? Sure. I don't think that's unlikely. They never found, now at, on his fireplace, I don't think I, they ever found tongs that match the scene. Well, if that would make sense, because you would have gotten rid of them. People do things that are 
easiest to do and are, their eyes will go on to. So if you're going to, if you're getting in a fight, you're going to go for something that is available. Like if you're in a kitchen, you'll throw plates, <laughs> you know, um, you know, if you're getting something out of the back of your car and somebody pisses you off, you'll get a tire iron. That's the way people work. Um, and right there, fireplace tongs. I'm not saying those were the weapon, but they sure are useful. Okay. Um, well, we see no, no damage down here. So, but there, it doesn't mean somebody can't be punched. It doesn't mean that she herself couldn't have hit him down here and hurt his neck and made him mad. And then they ran upstairs. We don't know what went on between the two of them. Or if anything did, maybe she just went upstairs and somebody else got in the house. I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just want to finish up with uh, Sam's possible issues. Um, so that's where that, you know, we don't know the weapon, but we know the weapon isn't there. So either the intruder took the weapon with him. But it's another interesting thing is nowhere does Sam Shepard say that he saw a weapon. Um, so that's problematic. The other thing I want to point out before I forget, the one reason that the police did not believe him was that this was what the house looked like. Um, so there were drawers that were pulled out and there was some stuff dumped on the floor. His, his medical bag was dumped over and his some of his things were taken and they were put in a green bag and that was what was found outside. And what the police looked at and what I would look at, here's another version of another area. Not trashed, things stacked, things pulled out, but not, you know, usually when you're pulling stuff out, you're trashing, everything, throwing everything, you're trying to find something. Um, this, does, this doesn't look like a real burglary. It looks staged. And the question is, when did this, this supposed guy even have an opportunity to burglarize. If he's busy trying to rape and murder uh, uh, Marilyn, why is he bothering with this crap? So what supposedly, you know, um, Sam's upstairs after he wakes up and does sort of, sort of doesn't check on his wife or does check, depending on the story he's telling, and then checks on his son, he hears a noise downstairs. Somebody's downstairs. In other words, this guy, theoretically, has just bludgeoned the living hell out of a, a woman, killed her, and he's going to stop and look around. Now, he knows the guy's in the house. By the way, he, he's already grappled with Sam up, uh, up in the bedroom, right? So he's, he's supposed to kill the woman, grappled with her husband, and just hit him on the back of the head and knocked him out. Doesn't bother to kill. Why, why, not, why not smash the rest of his head in? You already got it. And supposedly, one of the claims is he punched him. Yeah, why not use the weapon you're bludgeoning the woman with? Why wouldn't you just bludgeon the living crap out of him, too? It'll only take you another 15, 20 seconds, and there's nobody else in the house except the kid, why aren't you beating him to make sure he's not a witness? Why would you hit him once and go, okay. And then after you're not sure if he's going to wake up again, you go downstairs, you just tool around downstairs and you're looking at things, not worried about the guy coming out after you, not worried about him calling the police. You're just going to do this. So one of the things they've said is that, oh, well, the defense said, well, maybe they did that while he was still asleep on that day bed. Oh, so the, the burglar came in and burgled the place right next to where the guy's sleeping. Because this is in the same room the guy's sleeping in. <laughs> he doesn't know that somebody's pulling out drawers and doing stuff. He doesn't hear this guy at all. So the guy says, oh, look, there's a dude sleeping on the sofa. I think I'll just keep burglaring. And then I'm going to go upstairs and kill his, kill, see if there's somebody to kill upstairs. Even though I know there's a guy on the sofa, <laughs> on the day bed. This makes no sense. So before and after make no sense. And when I get to the DNA evidence and the blood evidence, you'll see it gets, it's even more shaky um, as far as that goes. But so the police thought this was a staged burglary, that the burglary never really happened. And the fact that the, the, the they're down by here, let me see if I can find that. Um, nope. Where'd it go? Sorry, I'm going to go through things again because I can't ever find things. What in the heck? Not again. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go find something again. Okay. Let's see where it went to. Where is it? Hmm. Something. Yeah. Wow. Hold on a second. 
Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I got to go search again. I've lost something yet again. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Every time I think I've fixed my problem and every time I haven't. <laughs> Why is it missing? Oh, that's where it is. Hold on. One more second here. Okay, I'm sending it over. I'm going to check your comments, and then I'm going to go on to the blood, the blood stuff, and I'll explain how the blood stuff is really crazy. Um, <laughs> the assailant wasn't feeling like killing anymore that day. Yeah, it, that, that's so not sensible. Um, an intruder tiptoed by a sleeping man on a daybed and went upstairs and beat a woman to death. There is an issue over that, and the issue about that is that there is, um, um, the claim is that there is a second way upstairs. And, and I have to admit that from looking at the pictures, I'm thinking that may be true. And uh, so therefore, is it in this picture? Um, there, see, see the arrow going here? The kitchen is over there. So if you come in the front door, you can go straight over here and up the stairs. But there does seem to me to be another way to come, to come around through the kitchen and go up the stairs this way. So could that have happened? My th my thinking is yes, it could. There was a claim it could have come in through the um, uh, cellar because there was some tool mark thing down by the cellar. But that that's a there's no actual entry that way. So the guy has to come into the first floor of the house, and then the client the question is, well, were the doors just left unlocked? And the guy because there's no sign of breaking and entering, so the guy would have just walked into the house. And then he happened to walk the right way through the kitchen and go up these stairs or and didn't see this guy on a day bed. Um, yet, supposedly he's burglarizing the room. And he's taking stuff in the room that the day bed's in. So then again, it makes uh, it's really questionable. Um, and if yes, and if this is true, if the intruder came in while he was sleeping and saw him, they would have beaten him first. And then they go up and take care of the woman. Yeah, they wouldn't leave. They wouldn't leave him sleeping on a sofa. Uh, so it's only if the guy came in and didn't see him sleeping on the sofa would he go up there. But here, let me just point this out right now because it just uh, before I forget, this is a home with a couple that lives there with a child. The husband is home. Where do you think the husband should be sleeping at this time of night? Where would you think the husband would be? Now, he was not out of town, and nobody believed he was out of town. So if someone's going to burglarize his house, they're going to assume that they're going up the stairs to the master bedroom. Well, they didn't call it back that then, but the, the parent bedroom. What would they expect to find in the parent bedroom at that particular house at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning? They wouldn't expect the husband to be sleeping on a day bed. They would expect a husband is sleeping in the room with his wife. So if you're going to type, if you're going to go in to rape and murder somebody, you could choose to go there and then beat the husband to death while he's asleep and then go after the wife. That has been, that has been done. But the problem is this guy left the guy alive twice, supposedly. And he took a risk if this were true of going into a house and supposedly trying to burgle it, although it didn't take anything. And what he did take, he just talked, chucked for no reason. Um, and then he goes upstairs and 
he just gets lucky that the wife is alone. And then, oh my goodness, the guy just found me, but I'm just going to let him live. I mean, the show, the, the whole story is so questionable. Um, Walter Matilda says, perhaps Marilyn was never fighting off an intruder in the bedroom. If it started as an argument between husband and wife, the commotion might be less loud and less frenzied. This is true. Uh, and we just don't know. We don't have no clue. Um, uh, perhaps she was pleading with him or trying to negotiate with him or threatening him through the clenched teeth, all the while trying not to wake and alarm the boy. Also possible. Um, by the time she was too late, it was too late to holler. But who was she going to holler to? It's a seven-year-old kid in the next room. Probably won't hear a darn thing. Yeah. So um, now let's go. Let me go to the DNA evidence because this is where he... Many people think that this is the reason Sam Shepard is not guilty. So he's got a squirrely story as squirrely as I've ever seen. Um, I'm not going to say what his motive is. Their marriage was in trouble. I believe that uh, he was cheating on her. That's also true. Possibility she was also cheating on him. And the whole marriage was about to break up. And there was issues there. Um, but the motive, I don't know it. However, his story just reeks. It really does. It reeks. Um, unless he were drunk off his butt which he should have said, I was so drunk, I didn't know what the hell was going on, <laughs> which would make more sense then. Why he didn't claim that if it was true? And my guess is it wasn't true. He must not have been drunk. And so instead of saying I was drunk and I couldn't find my way up the stairs and I couldn't, didn't know what was happening and I was blurred out and my vision was gone, he didn't say any of that, which I find fascinating because I would have gone there if I were lying. <laughs> um, because they were supposed to that they even claimed he was drinking, the prosecution. But when he gave his own statement, it, he wasn't. So it's very strange. But the problem is, what about the DNA? So eventually what happened is there's two levels of DNA here, um, which gets a lot more confusing. All right. One is um, there's the original guy that did the DNA. Um, and I think both of them were hired by the defense. So there's always something questionable because then you get confirmation bias. And they might say, I'm totally objective, but you're paying me a whole lot of money. So I might lean that way. And if I don't lean that way, you'll fire me. So um, the first guy's name was Kirk. His last name was Kirk. Uh, the second guy's name was um, Muhammad Ta Tahir. Um, actually, there are two of them, uh, Ranajit uh, Chakraborty. Uh, they were DNA specialists that worked for the defense. All right, so we gotta take that into consideration. So the first guy did, did this analysis and he came up with a whole bunch of interesting things. One was he said the guy was left-handed, which Sam Shepard is not. Mind you, if you're looking at um, suspects, I, I, as, far, as far as I know, I don't think that um, uh, he's, he's uh, left-handed either. So I don't think he was. So anyway, they left-handedness was was kind of a joke and, and and that that wasn't proven so we had this kirk guy uh just he had a very fanciful way of determining certain things and i'm gonna i'm gonna run through a few uh a dna things for you so um you can understand them let me see if i can find them all right all right all right there were these dna this dna stuff um Oh, it gets very, it's, it gets very complicated. But the problem here is, I can't remember if this is the first guy or the second guy now. Um, oh, no, this is the second guy. Okay, let me see if I can find the original. Uh, I want to do this one first. Uh, okay, Toby Wilson, an expert witness and analyst on both blood spatter and DNA, suggested that the difficulties in physical analysis after all this time was to be expected. In addition to the expected aging of certain types of samples, contamination in samples that old is quite common. At that time, the samples were taken. Many tests simply weren't routine and therefore weren't done in the first place. And the collection methods for those that were taken were appropriate for the science as it existed at that time. They handled specimen with their bare hands. No one wore masks or covered their footwear at the crime scene. The blood on Sam's pants, for example, contained, as far as testing revealed, none of Marilyn or Sam's blood, nor that of Richard Eberling. Logically, at least Marilyn's blood should have been detected. That it was not detected is a sign of contamination. So he had these, um, so he had these, uh, the pants. Should be it over here. Oh, wrong one. 
There, these are the pants. You see, that's the basic stain that they found. No blood spatter on there. And again, this guy supposedly was grappling with somebody in these pants. And then he's falling down on the ground. And then he's getting up and finding his wife and supposedly checking her pulse. So there's blood everywhere. I have. He's only got this on him. Then he goes downstairs, goes out to the beach, grapples with some, maybe a different guy. <laughs> maybe he didn't have blood on him because he was a different guy. Maybe he's the burglar dude. But again, he ends up with this. But that 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 doesn't match anybody. So who the heck's DNA is it? Oh, you see, that's the unknown person. So it can't even be Eberling, the one everybody thinks killed her. So what's, and the chances are it's contamination. First of all, I don't think those are pants he was wearing. I believe that much more likely he, if he had pants that were spattered, he got rid of them along with the shirt or he wasn't wearing any and he just went in the water and all that and put some other pants on and then maybe went back and bent down someplace and got whatever, got some contamination. I don't have any clue, but it's, it's really so vague. Um, and then let's see, um, let's see if I can find this other one. Um, okay, hold on. Um, The DNA, hold on. the DNA is very complicated, so I, I don't want to get too too heavy into it. Um, so I'm trying to find out the best stuff. And I may just have to, oh, here's an interesting point. Kirk, who taught criminalistics at the University of California, died in 1970. Then they, what happened was he had, he was the first guy that did this stuff, they, they did the blood testing. And he could not do DNA testing. He could only do um, what kind of blood type was there. A former student, James Murdoch, visited Kirk's office in the Life Science Building while it was being cleaned out and found many of the professor's things earmarked for the garbage heap. I observed a cardboard box marked Shepherd Case 578. He wrote in a report on his handling of the evidence that was obtained by the Post. Since I was familiar with this fam famous case, I thought I should save slash rescue this box for historical purposes. So he took it to his office at the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Coroner's Department Crime Laboratory, where he took a quick glance at the contents and shoved it under his examination table. There it sat for 24 years. When Murdoch retired in 1993, he moved the box to a shelf in his garage. That is not, <laughs> that is not how you keep evidence from being contaminated. Now, mind you, if you didn't think DNA existed, you wouldn't have that much of a problem with taking things out and going, I wonder what this is. I wonder what that is. Huh. You know, God knows how what contamination is. Now, when the later guy, uh, Tahir, got this, inf got this box, which was probably highly contaminated, he did some DNA studies. And what happened was he couldn't come up with a full DNA profile. So he came up with a little bit. And he did these strips. And he said, oh, look, um, uh, I think... For example, do you see this blood stain here? This was actually it's like like it's only that big. Now this becomes a very interesting thing. Um, the claim here, and it looks huge here, but it's it's like this big. It isn't a spatter pattern from hitting her and flipping blood off of the weapon. This is something where somebody apparently touched the wall somehow. And what happened here was that. The claim is, and this is where I think things get really, really squirrely. The claim is that her two, uh, Marilyn's, Marilyn's teeth were knocked out, two of them. And the, the, the prosecution says they were just knocked out of her mouth. The defense says she bit somebody. And when they pulled her hand away, I pulled her teeth out. First of all, I'm not sure how easy that is to do. I don't even know that it's possible. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> you injure yourself a lot doing crime scene reenactment. But I don't know that even believe that if she bit him and he pulled his hand away, that would actually break her teeth out of her mouth. I find that kind of unlikely. But that was the claim by the defense. Therefore, when she bit him, he then had an injury on his hand and he was bleeding from that injury. Badly, apparently. So when he left the room, he hit the wall and left his blood there. Now, mind you, they tried to say that Eberling's DNA matched that. That is not true. So this new guy, Tahir, said that there was, I guess, Marilyn's blood and Tahir, the DNA from Tahir was there. So therefore, it was Tahir. 
I mean, sorry, <laughs> Eberling. Tahir said Eberling's DNA was there. It wasn't. D Eberling's DNA, what he found was that he couldn't be excluded, but he couldn't. It was like one out of so many thousand, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. So it wasn't that he only had partial DNA, so he couldn't prove it was Eberling's DNA. He just said he couldn't be excluded. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was the blood um, type was C, which was um, which was Marilyn's blood type. But Eberling's blood type is A. And there was no A blood type here. It was only C. So he couldn't, it wasn't his blood <laughs> that was there. So it's nonsense. But it gets even worse than that. So now we have a claim. This guy had a bleeding hand, right? And it couldn't couldn't be Sam Shepard because Sam Shepard didn't have a bitten hand. Um, so it must be Eberling or somebody like him. But here's the problem. This guy's supposedly bleeding enough to when he walks down steps, he drops blood. So they're supposedly... That's his blood, some stranger's blood. But, but here's the problem. All right. And if I can hope, I'm hoping my, my picture came in. Please come in. Oh, it's going to be troublesome. Trying again. I have to try again because it just doesn't want to come through. There was, which is what I want to show you, uh, inside the house from her room, coming down the stairs, mind you. There's a, he's got to come out of the bedroom. He's got to come down the stairs. It's, it's quite dark, right? So his hand is coming down the stairs. They're saying there's some droplets on the stairs. If his hand got bit, can you all tell me what doesn't he have on his hands? What's missing from his hands? And I, I never see anybody discuss this and I think it's really weird. Uh, the claim is that they, they believe that they were smashed out. Um, uh, open wounds. That's not it. If somebody bit him in the hands, what is missing? No, not, no. Sam Sepper did not have any teeth marks. Um, there's a claim, uh, that Eberling had, um, a scratch on his hand, but he was supposedly the guy that came over to their house earlier on and did a lot of window work and screen work. And Hey, if you're working with the hands as a handyman, you, you, you messed up your hands a lot. No. Ah, thank you, Stephanie. Gloves. If she bit him in the hand to bleed, the man was not wearing gloves. Now, he is in the room without gloves. He's going down the stairs. Is he never touching the banister going all the way down? Then... So my picture didn't come over. I'm going to try one more time. <laughs> I think it's the internet connection here. It just kind of sucks sometimes. Nope. Won't show up. Oh, oh wait a minute. I got it. Yay. Finally showed up. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I really wanted this one. Okay. Banisters coming down. There should does the guy not? I mean, if you're coming down in the dark, usually people will touch the banister so they don't lose their balance. There's no blood on the banisters. There is no fingerprints on the banister. Then the guy is supposedly ransacking the crap out of the house after he kills uh, uh, um, the wife. Where's the blood? Shouldn't there be blood all over? The drawers, shouldn't there be fingerprints everywhere? And then this guy has to go down 50 steps. This is going toward the beach. It's one of these really long staircases. And it's a lot. I mean, and again, it's dark. The guy's got to somehow go down there. 
Where's the blood going down the banisters? Where's the fingerprints going down the banisters? Makes no sense. If the guy's not wearing gloves, his blood and his fingerprints should be way more than exists. So they had so little that all I can say is that Eberling, his, his DNA, his blood, uh, that one sample they had on the wall, the only blood in that room was, was uh, C, which was, which was the wife. Okay, so it was her blood. It wasn't Eberling's blood, no matter what that DNA said. So if it, <laughs> Eberling's blood wasn't there in spite of the fact that the DNA could match him or could, could not exclude him, it doesn't even matter because it wasn't his blood type. And the other stuff is so questionable that I think that we have a major contamination issue from 50 years, from bad, bad handling of everything in 50 years. I just don't buy any of it. So consequently, the DNA is really crappy. And I don't think that it excludes Sam Shepard. And I don't think it includes Eberlin. Now, mind you, Eberlin, he's a creepy dude. Man. <laughs> There's nothing. That's not a likable dude. What? He was one of the things they claimed that he was found with with uh, Marilyn's uh, rings. Um, he burglared and got her rings, but it wasn't during that day. He apparently got that from her brother's house a couple of years later. So that's meaningless as well. Then there's a claim on the sperm that they they, they checked out. They supposedly the DNA guy uh, to hear found that there was some sperm and. It, it could, couldn't rule him out, but the sperm had no tails on it. So that sperm was not left in her body the day she was raped. I'm mean, sorry, the day she was murdered. There was no evidence of rape at all. There was no injuries to the genitals or nothing. So there was no evidence of rape. And the sperm that was in there had no tails on it was something that happened two or three days before. So either it's contamination or she had she was messing with somebody else who wasn't her husband. But it isn't the guy who was there that night. Now, there was the issue of when she was on the bed, her, her pants were pulled down below her, her uh, genital area. And one, actually, the, 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 the pajamas, they were pulled off of one leg. And so they were hanging on the other leg, essentially. Her feet were kind of, I didn't want to show the crime scene photos because that I don't do that during my shows, but her feet were like, her legs were like through the bottom of the bed where the, where the, there's a railing at the bed. So it's a weird place. You can't really rake somebody in that position. So, cause her legs are there. Um, but she did have her pants off her, her, uh, her pajamas off of one leg and on just hanging on one. And then her supposedly the top was pushed up. Now that doesn't indicate rape. What it can indicate is somebody attempting a rape. That's true. It can also uh, uh, be a, a, a marital rape. It could be that he was pissed off and went after her and she threw her on the bed and pulled her, pulled the one pant off and then he was trying to get at her and she pulled her legs away and pushed and all went hell from there. No, nothing, she was never raped, but that husband was intending to, to do so. Or, or in the fight, he pulled on her, you know, there, sometimes pajamas are really light so she could have been trying to get away from me and he could have pulled on her, grabbed at her and pulled on, pulled, pulled a pant leg off. That could have happened too. Uh, she wasn't wearing underwear. So, I mean, you tend to look sort of naked when that happens and you know that her, the, the uh, top was up. Well, that could just be the struggle. And then it happened to land there. Um, apparently he said he put a, Sam Shepard said he put a, something over her to cover her bottom half so that she wouldn't like that if she was seen that way. Okay. Does that mean he, wasn't guilty. No, it just means he did that. Um, so we don't have proof of a rape. We don't have actually proof of an attempted rape. There's some things that look that way, but, but whatever happened, nobody actually raped her that evening. Nobody left their DNA in her that evening. So again, nothing proves that Eberling did anything. Creepy dude that he was. He did work around their house. He was a, was a handyman. And let me tell you, handymans are one of the popular serial killer <laughs> professions. I would be looking at him because he's creepy and a handyman. Um, and he access to people's houses. That's where I don't know how much he, when they said he was a burglar, I don't know how much he broke into people's houses rather than just steal from people's houses when he was doing work on their houses. So that's, I can't get a good grip on 
whether he broke in any place, because if somebody came to the uh, to the shepherd's house and broke in, that's different than a guy who steals because he's already on the property. And that seems to be what he did. Now, mind you, eventually he did try to take advantage of very elderly ladies. And one of the elderly ladies he was helping with a few things ended up dying. And he was he was convicted of that because he said she fell and maybe she fell. You know what I mean? Um, and he ended up in prison. Now, there was another woman that was a sister of that woman who was bludgeoned to death. And so people go, oh, well, you know, looks so much like this crime. Eberling is definitely guilty of both. But there's never any proof that he killed the sister, although he could have. But even if he did, it doesn't mean he killed her. So, so we end up with this problem. The DNA does not prove Eberling did it. That's for sure. Secondly, some of the DNA appears to say there was a third person there, but it's so wishy-washy that it's it could well be contamination. So that really doesn't mean a lot. Um, the next issue we have is that the whole thing about him being bitten, I just think is nonsense. And that's why there is no blood as much as there should be or fingerprints all over the place because the guy would have no gloves on. That just to me makes no sense. Um, so then we don't necessarily, if the, if the guy wasn't bitten, then who is there really other people, another third person's DNA there? DNA, another person's blood there? Is there really? Because nobody was bitten. He wasn't necessarily injured, the person who did it. So that's another issue. Um, and to me, it, the thing that bothers me about this the most is that if a guy chose to do this, he'd have to say, come in at three o'clock in the morning, knowing there was a male in the house, leaving the male alive instead of killing him, not actually raping the woman, just beating her for what reason? Who knows? And then staging a, not actually burglarizing the place, but doing a fake burglary and then leaving the stuff. And then leaving the, stuff, the guy alive again when he's tackled on the beach. It makes no sense. It just makes zero sense. However, Sam Shepard, Hmm. On the other hand, his story stinks. It totally 100% does not work for me. It sounds totally fabricated from beginning to end. So if I had to choose at this point who I think killed Marilyn Shepard, I'd go with him. Uh, Eberly is a creepy dude, but I just don't have proof he was there um, at all. There's no DNA proof he was there. There's nothing else that proves he was there. So could he have done it? Well, I guess he could have somehow gotten into the house. Somehow. As I can't even come up with, you know, he didn't actually burgle the place, even though he is a burglar, supposedly. He didn't actually rape, although they said he would have wanted to do that, but he didn't. And then he left the guy alive twice. Really? And then you could say, well, he brought somebody with him, but that doesn't make any sense either. And then the guy's dressed in white. The only person dressed in white was Marilyn. That was her clothing that night. But a burglar coming in in white clothing, I just don't buy that either. So, you know, and <laughs> that the the house, uh, that there was a double, a female murder of her and the husband just stood by and watched it is ridiculous. So that F. Lee, F. Lee Bailey stuff worked on, the, worked on the jury. But that's just F. Lee Bailey throwing up ridiculous stories. Um, as alternative suspects. So I would say, in my opinion, he has not been proven not to be the guy. He's just, he's been found not guilty um, by, a, by a jury and that's it. Um, but I have a hard time getting past his, uh, and he had a chance to defend himself. And it just, he lost, the first trial he did speak Second trial, he didn't, didn't take the stand. Maybe because Effie Bailey said, Jesus, God, dude, don't do that. <laughs> um, uh, Stephanie says, I want to look into the other couple that was there, not as suspects, but because their relationship with the shepherds could provide a direction to look for motive. Well, there was a claim that maybe she was pregnant by the man. That was one of the possible claims. And that's why the wife went in and wanted to kill her because she was messing with her husband. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Recent DNA tests performed on old blood and sperm samples have yielded nothing but inconclusive results. I think people are putting too much value 
on what are now unreliable samples, extremely unreliable samples. Um, yeah, and, and the contamination problem is, is huge. And also, one has to understand that Tahir, Kirk and Tahir, both of them, they were leaning toward the defense in this. And what happens, people think that everything, the conclusions you draw off a DNA thing are absolute, but there's a lot of subjectivity in, you know, in what you see as the results. So it's not, people think DNA is absolute, like it's computer driven. It's not. Somebody has to look at that stuff and make determinations. And I think some of it's just, uh, you know, I say uh, confirmation bias type of thing. Uh, Linda says, if I'm a burglar or even a murderer, I'm not going to break into a house after it's obvious they've been entertaining and are all still awake. Well, that's a good point. Um, they went home. I think they went home at 1230 or something like that. Um, so, yeah, uh, he would have to wait outside until the lights went down. Um, well, it was three or four o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, that could be a better time to go in. Maybe that's why the person did wait so long to go into the home. But it it was clear that there were, people were there. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, it just, you know, this, for example, Eberling, he's been, he was in that house. He hung around with Marilyn sometimes because he's doing work for them and he liked her and they hung around. He was there with her when Sam was not. Why didn't he just go there during the day and rape and murder her then? You know, um, why didn't he do it when he was out of town? Because he probably could know. Why would he do it when he's in town and at night when he's there? I mean, it, it really makes no sense. Yeah, staging is what the police thought that all the burglary stuff was. Um, that That is correct, yes. And of course, Sam's and Marilyn's were expected, uh, but nobody else's. And again, if he, the guy was not wearing gloves, where the hell are his fingerprints? Um, um, it's the vanishing t-shirt which gets me and Shepard getting knocked unconscious twice and not calling the police immediately. Yeah. The not calling the police really bothers me because he's just found his wife dead and he's not in good shape. I can understand. Maybe he could check on his kid that I get. Um, once he finds his kid is alive, which he doesn't seem to know that he actually figured that out. Um, I would be up. I would be right there on the phone. I'd get a weapon. I'd, I'd grab the phone, call them, call the police, tell them to get out there because I want to protect my family. What's left of it, at least. I'm not going to go down and chase some dude downstairs because if he knocks me out, what do you think that guy's going to do? Maybe go upstairs and kill my kid. Uh, not, you know, and I haven't even gotten the police on the way. It makes no sense. Um, yeah, I, I have a, I have a lot of problems with that. The disappearing T-shirt. He says the guy must have taken it. I feel that the guy must have taken it. <laughs> um, so that that's, yeah, that's the vanishing t-shirt is really questionable. And again, I don't even trust that the pants he didn't have. I don't know that they were on him at the time of the murder. He could have, they could have gone upstairs and gotten ready for bed. He could have gotten his pants off when the argument ensued. And, and uh, therefore the pants weren't in the area that, that the blood was. And then whatever happened, happened. And he got rid of evidence and then he put the pants on. So he looked like a perfectly fine pants. I don't know if they were the same pants he was wearing when the people were over there, because I don't know how much the Hawks are like, oh, I see you're wearing those pants. I mean, would they know? I mean, personally, I wouldn't. I don't do fashion very well. Um, maybe he has two pants that look similar. My dad used to have most of his clothes. He used to have like, you know, so many black pants, so many gray pants, so many blacks, you know, it, White shirts, white shirts, white shirts. I wouldn't know if it was the same one. I'd have no, I'd have no way of knowing that um, at all. Yeah, uh, there's no, yeah, there's no DNA exoneration at all in this case, and so it's, and that's again, it is possible that somebody else was there and did it, but there's nothing to prove that. Uh, so we're left with a questionable third person which he, even he can't seem to figure out. So, yeah. Um, let's see what else. Um, I'll go back up here a second. Oh, Kirk. Kirk stated that the, the killer would have been covered in blood. Well, because theoretically, if he's, you know, there's, there was sp blood spatter on the wall. So if you're hitting somebody and you're going like this, then blood will go on you. But, you know, it helps if you're rolling around in the water. 
for a long time to get rid of every bit of blood evidence on you. So, I mean, if, if he hadn't ever gone near the water, I think we would have a better clue that he didn't wash anything away. But there's that long time downtime between when she supposedly was killed and when he called the friends instead of the police. What was he doing? Now, of course, he could, again, he could have been out of it if he really had a concussion. But did he really have a concussion? Because I say his, I say his story doesn't really hold water, except he was in it. But, you know, um, <laughs> I find myself looking at the smiling photo of Marilyn and thinking, tell us, uh, don't we wish? Oh, let me let me show you a comment somebody made, which I kept because I thought it was a good one. No one will ever know the truth. The truth died a long time ago. Well, thank you, Pauline, whoever you are. <laughs> and, and she's right about that in many ways that, you know, because in, in, in the eyes of the jury and the, and the prosecution, they believed his story didn't, didn't make sense and that there was no proof of somebody else doing all the things he claimed. Um, they believed he did have motive and the jury found him guilty. Um, again, I wasn't in the courtroom. Would I have found that to be true if I were sitting in the courtroom? I don't know. Second jury came in and F. Lee Bailey did his usual magic. He's good at that stuff. And he got the jury conf to, to, be, to say, well, you know, maybe, there, maybe, maybe somebody else did it. Therefore, um, and of course, there's, then there was this hope, you know, that the DNA would just prove everything. Uh, and but the DNA, you know, you get one guy who tests the DNA and then you're supposed to go on his word that this is what the DNA tells us. And he said some strange things. And so did Kirk, as a matter of fact, that just made no sense. He said, for example, that there were. How did he put that? Oh, oh, the reason that that, that blood stain on the wall, that it was there were two different kinds of of uh, uh, type type um, O blood, Marilyn's blood O type O, and somebody else's type O. Somehow he said you could differentiate between this type O and that type O because of something. A lot of people say this is nonsense. So if that's true, then. There was no third person. It was just her blood. And so it wasn't Eberling, but it wasn't anybody else either. <laughs> you know? so it's just, you know, you can go crazy trying to figure all these, you know, is the DNA accurate? Isn't the DNA accurate? What, what are the chances type of thing? Um, do we believe what is being said? Um, and then if, if somebody else was there, is his, is his story entirely true? In spite of the way he said it and all the things, it just, was he really innocent? I have a hard time believing that, but, you know, can't prove he's guilty. Um, well, initial police work needs to be thorough. Too much spin and room for to confuse jury's lady. But they didn't have DNA back then, so that was out. I mean, they had as much as they could go with. I don't know that they failed in their job. They had, they had as uh, the statements, they had, um, they did the blood work. They looked for the, the weapon. They didn't find a weapon. They did what they could do. And then DNA came up later. Now, maybe at the time, if they had the processes that we have now, this case would have been solved really quickly, but we don't also don't know that, you know, what if, what if even back then um, they couldn't come up with DNA that was, it was, was, you know, maybe there's a lot of these mixed things in this whole scenario, mixed DNA. Um, what if uh, there's just, again, something that got in there that somebody, somebody in one of these places got really clever and said, well, you know, he's a doctor. He could have bought uh, blood. And that's actually true. Because I know I worked in a hospital. And if you know, they go, always have these things of blood just sitting there. You just go, <laughs> take a blood sample. If you chuck a blood sample on a crime scene, you're home free. Yep. Same thing with uh, essentially with um, what you can do is you can go down to the local park and you can pick up a condom on the ground, add a little water, and chuck that on the victim. <laughs> Simple things like that because, and touch DNA, of course, is 
causing a lot of trouble these days because touch DNA is so easily moved from place to place that people are getting accused of being at a place that they were never at because of touch DNA. So there are ways that the DNA is not necessarily 100% absolute. And you gotta be very careful of that. Um, Melissa says, uh, maybe the jury just thought there was too much reasonable doubt and that was explained well in trial and not necessarily because he didn't do it, but just not enough to convict. Yeah, I think that Effie Bailey is a very, very persuasive lawyer, which is why people hire him. Um, and they just felt like, well, we're not sure. And, you know, I, I can't honestly say if I were on that jury, I don't know which way I'd go. I mean, because I'm not going, I'm going on, I think it's a stage crime scene. I don't have evidence of a, another person. His story stinks. And he, he, he had issues with his wife. And so he may have motive. Would I feel that's enough to convict? Or, you know, or is there enough room there to say maybe some of that's true, but maybe there really was somebody else, you know? And this is where it gets really tricky when you don't have solid evidence, um, physical evidence to prove. Um, you know, somebody could say, you know, well, it looks like a staged crime scene, but maybe the guy's just an idiot. <laughs> maybe the guy was going to rape her, but then he got spooked. And so he ran off and he never finished what he wanted to do. Maybe he was there with another buddy and he was upset. So once you start creating scenarios for the jury, they go, okay. They get a, the same reason I feel like I was reading all this stuff and I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to present this case. I was, I've got so much information here. I became overwhelmed. My eyes started crossing. I'm like, I don't even know what to talk about here because it's so much. And if I were in a court of law and I was an attorney, <laughs> I'd be throwing all that crap out at you because I'm being paid $300 an hour. I will, I will stack that stuff up. I will throw out everything and you will just sit there and your eyes will glaze over and you'll go, I don't know. I just haven't a clue. And you're not allowed to take notes. I mean, I couldn't even do it trying to, I couldn't even do it trying to do screenshots and reading the book. I was, you know, uh, you know, you know, doing yellow and red in the books. And I did all that and I'm still, I'm still lost my mind. I can't, I feel sorry for juries because I mean, there's no way in God's earth they can figure this crap out. So when you get cases like this, it's amazing. I mean, I think they just, a lot of it turns out to be they're exhausted and they kind of just go with their gut. And that's not a good thing to go with, whether you find the guy guilty or not guilty. It's not a good thing. So, yeah. Um, is it common for an innocent person to provide police with a clumsy, unbelievable story? Have you seen something like this in modern times? Um, sometimes psychopaths will do that. Like he told some stories, like the police asked him if they, they told him at a certain point they found his blood in the house and he goes, oh yeah, it's because I was over there before and I cut my finger on something and blood all over the house. And people are like, well, he just confessed to the crime. Did he? Because he's a psychopath, in, in my opinion. And he, he probably lies most of the time. <laughs> so the question is, is he lying himself out of trouble or is he lying himself into trouble just because he likes to talk too much? And, he, and maybe it's like, oh, please say my blood's here. Okay, I might have come up with reason if, just in case it was. Maybe not to do with his crime, but maybe I did believe in the house. I don't remember doing it, you know, but I do a lot of work in the house. I could have cut my finger. And maybe I should just say I did who knows? So yes, sometimes people do lie, make up stories when they're innocent. Um, the problem with Sam Shepard's stories is that I would like to see Peter Hyatt's take on, on that thing I just did. Um, because I see deception all over the place and I see fabrication. I see, I see, he's not just telling the story. He's constantly telling how he feels about things and how he thinks it could be, you know, <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's so bizarre that it just doesn't come. I mean, I would think if I was telling that story, here's what I would have done. Theoretically, if this is what happened, I would have said I was sleeping on, on, on the day bed and suddenly I heard, I woke, I woke up to hearing Pat, 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 Pat. And I was like, Oh my God, what's wrong? I ran up the stairs and I ran into the room and, I ran into somebody in the room who I thought, you know, it was between me and the bed and I grabbed him and then we, we, we tussled around and then I felt he hit me. And, and then I guess I blacked out at that point. I woke up and I got up and, and I wanted to check to see if she was okay. And 
Um, and I checked, I took, I said, I would have touched, I would have looked at her face and whatever. I would have turned, I would have turned on the damn light. I ran over and turned on the light and ran back to see what, what, what had happened and checked on her. And I found, oh my God, she's dead. She's dead, clearly dead, but I have to check on my son. And I ran to the next room, checked on my son, pushed him. And I said, you're right. You're right. And he said, well, what's wrong? Okay, go back to sleep. And then I ran back and picked up the telephone and called the police. And then I heard, I heard somebody downstairs. So I blocked the door and pulled up, pulled something in front of the door. So he couldn't get up there to hurt my son. And we called the police. I found a heavy object. You see, I'm just telling what I did. I'm not saying, and then I, it seemed like, I felt like, and I imagine, you know, it, <laughs> see, it's just, it, I'm just telling the facts. I'm telling what happened and not all this other gobbledygook. So it, to me, that is just, I find it fabricated, 100% fabrication. I may be wrong, but as a, I've looked at all the statements before and I see where that seems to me that they're not, that's not the truth, that the, what they're saying is off. And what he's saying seems to me like he's trying to, A, explain away why he's not running to us, running up the stairs to save his wife. <laughs> because he's got to include, he's got to have her yell to him so that she's upstairs and he's downstairs. That means he's not committing the crime, you see. But if he gets there too soon, so he seems like has reasons why he doesn't quite get there. And then he's got reasons why he doesn't save her. And he's got reasons for why he doesn't, know who it is. He's got reason. It's just, it's all over the place as far as it's just so bizarre. It just sounds like he's trying to explain away because he, because the real thing would be to him, if he did this, the real, he might be taking pieces of what really happened and he can't quite get them out of his head. So he might've seen her, the white, the white clothing, because that's what she was wearing. You know, he might have, he didn't call the police because he wasn't going to call the police on himself. Um, he didn't know they checked on his kid because why does he need to check on his kid if he's the killer, right? And that's why he can't quite remember whether he did that or not. So, so, so it's probably partial. If he did it, it's the partial, the truth. And then he's using that to fabricate a story and it just isn't holding up very well. So that's, that's my theory. Um, <laughs> not guilty. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but you know, yeah. And I, I think that, you know, when people say, well, why did the police focus in on him? Probably that's what, because they didn't believe him. You know, it, it's not like they wanted to believe he killed his wife. You know, he said, the thing, you know, I have to think of it this way. He's a prominent surgeon in town. They're friends with the mayor, you know, which is easier. Blame the schmuck over here, <laughs> the sleazy dude, the handyman, or go after this prominent businessman, uh, this surgeon, which one's easier? Hey, if I'm the police, this is a better fall guy. I could, I could nail him. Everybody will feel sorry for the, for, for, for oh, Sam and the police will be heroes. Oh, you caught the guy that killed Sam's wife. Isn't that wonderful? Why the heck would the police go after him if they didn't really believe it was him? So I, sometimes the people say, oh, the police, they just want, I'm like, no, the police would prefer not to go after him. Are you kidding me? because <laughs> I have worked cases where that's exactly what happened. I'm going to do one of my cases. Somebody asked me the other week, um, uh, one, of, one of the comments, Pat, have you ever been wrong? <laughs> it's like, um, and I, I pointed out, well, it depends what wrong means. Okay. Um, anybody can be do a, do a, do a uh, profile and be wrong. This is true. Um, which is why I say profiling belongs in the police investigation where it's part of the investigative process. So you look at the evidence and you come up with the best leads and you follow those leads and get new information. You might change those leads. Pro profiling really shouldn't be just done where you say, uh, come in and you go make a pronouncement and then I must be right. Um, but I've worked on cases uh, and I worked on this one case, which I'm going to, I will probably do. Um, it's a Tennessee case. And uh, police chief asked me to look at this and I did. And I went through the evidence and I, and I had everything. I had the f photos and everything. So I wasn't missing stuff. And he, he was like really pleased with my profile. He says, Oh my God, that explains everything. I see this absolutely now. He agreed with me 100%. But for whatever reasons, uh, the state stepped in on that case and they went after this handyman, <laughs> handyman. And, uh, 
after like seven confessions, um, <laughs> they got the right one. Um, and he was arrested and convicted. And I still think that was not the guy because none of the evidence supported that guy at all. And I had so much evidence pointing somewhere else. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I would like to see the Innocence Project take that up. Now, mind you, the guy was like this guy. He was a low life scumming psychopath. <laughs> you know, He wasn't a great guy, but I don't believe he killed the woman because I, the, all the evidence doesn't point to him. It points elsewhere. A lot of it. <laughs> so was I wrong? Or did they, did they convict the wrong guy? Um, so I'm going to do that show one day and I'll, I'll see what you all think about that. You know, whether I was wrong or, you know, and again, it's, it's always possible, always possible. All the evidence can point to one direction, just, it, and, but it turns out to be somebody else. Is that, does that happen? Not often. Usually if there's like 20 pieces of evidence, a point over here, it's usually over here. But are there times when there's a lot of evidence that seems like it's there and it's very coincidental and it could be somebody else? Does it ever happen? Well, I guess it does happen. Um, the question is, in that case, are you wrong or was it just an anomaly? Uh, oh, Sandra, uh, Sandra Cantu was one I said, absolutely. When I was doing, I think I was doing Nancy Grace or whatever. And I was asked about the Sandra Cantu case when, when she went missing and she found an, uh, I guess she was, I think she was found in a, uh, stuffed in a suitcase or whatever. And I think myself and a bunch of other profilers said, well, it looks like a child sex predator. And it turned out to be her friend's mother. And they're like, what the heck? <laughs> but we didn't, I mean, that was an anomaly. That doesn't happen hardly ever. But it happened then. We were all surprised. So was I wrong then? Well, you know, I was just doing a television bit. You know what I mean? I wasn't doing, I wasn't working at the police department and analyzing all the evidence. I might've said something different. But for that little short TV bit, yeah, I didn't have it right. <laughs> sure, surely. <laughs> uh, um, why did the DA? The DA? I'm not sure what you're talking about here. Why did the DA do that was dishonest? I'm looking, I'm trying to look back to see where you're at um, on that one. You'll have to let me know. Oh, that's a good point, Stephanie. The case really demonstrates the importance of using primary sources for analysis. There's so much speculation spin that gets layered on later. Oh my God, there's so much in this case. I mean, I'm reading stuff going, whoa, what the heck? <laughs> and it, it, I got to the point where I couldn't even keep my notes straight on it because it was so garbled, garbled. And so, and some of it, one of the things they also do, which people don't recognize is that in order to make it look valid, there's a lot of information poured into one spot with a lot of scientific stuff and little legally terms and all that stuff to the point where you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> and when you don't know what they're saying, especially with DNA, because it's very complex, you just have to either accept what they say or give up. And that's what the jury does all the time. Because I mean, I've done a lot of cases where I've had to study the DNA issues, um, but I'll tell you, it's still, it's still so confusing. I'm not a scientist. Um, so I, I have to really struggle to figure out if the DNA makes any sense or not. And you pull off those 12 people off a bus stop, like I always call them 12 people who ended up doing jury duty and they're going DNA, you know, and, and, you know, it's interesting because, you remember that one I read at the beginning, this brilliant DNA analyst, brilliant guy to hear. Well, if he's so freaking brilliant. How is the jury supposed to understand what he's saying? He's not making it clear because you, you all know how it is when you like, re, you know, have some kind of um, uh, some kind of thing you have to put together or whatever. And an engineer wrote the an, an instructions. You look at this going, Jesus, this guy has no clue that people don't understand what he's saying because he's an engineer and he doesn't think like other people. So an analyst puts all a bunch of stuff out there, doesn't think like a lay person. So the lay person doesn't understand what they're saying. And then of course, then there's all these people, all these experts that come in and they're all disagreeing with each other. And obviously somebody's not telling the truth or somebody's wrong. How do we know which one's wrong or which one's lying? And 
it gets to be a complicated mess. So thankfully, most crimes are very basic and very simple to solve. <laughs> but when you get to these really complicated ones, uh, then then just it all becomes like a, a massive mess. And, and everybody's got a new book. And every, then there's always the, the documentary. And then there's this and then there's that. And this will, be, this will be discussed for the next 100 years. And I'd say most people, I think probably 80% are leaning toward this guy because of the, of the, because of the uh, information out there. Um, oh, oh, that question. Oh, <sighs> well, there is a good question. Um, speaking of very well known, the, the, the woman who was murdered was very prominent in town and so is the family. And the, 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 the handyman was a scumbag. Um, I don't know that he was an easier person to prosecute. And when I do the whole show, you'll see, see, see so many of the details of it. It's just, it's a really fascinating case. There was a loss of evidence, which didn't help matters. Um, and yeah, it's 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 it was complicated, but I guess they found a guy they thought they could to charge with, and uh, yeah, you have to you have to wait to see the video on that because it's 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 something else, it really is. Um, uh, Shepherd's hi, Carrie. Uh, Shepherd's account has implausibility of Jeff McDonald. Yeah, but Jeff annihilated his family, and Sam did not. So some parallels. Um, yeah, uh, the son was still alive. So. The difference could be Jeffrey McDonald's case, and, and wait, I do have a video on that. If you haven't seen my video on that yet, put in profiler Pat Brown, Mc, Jeffrey McDonald into the uh, YouTube search engine, you'll find it, or you can go through, go through my playlist. Um, Jeffrey McDonald wanted 100% freedom, and by eliminating his family, he got that. Um, in this case, it seemed more like something, if he committed the crime, something that uh, triggered it and he, he lost control um, and was happy to go on, you know, didn't want to hurt his son. He wanted to go on with the son, but he didn't want maybe the wife or who knows, maybe he didn't want the new baby. Maybe he thought the new baby wasn't his. Who I, you know, Again, motive is very difficult in this because uh, I don't have enough information on that. I, I, I'd have to view, interview Everybody, who, mind you, when he went on, he became a massive alcoholic after he got out of prison and two people died on the table that he cut cut wrongly because he was, I guess, drinking. And so, yeah, so he basically killed two people. Um, and then he became a wrestler and then he became killer, which to me is very odd that if you thought, if you were innocent of killing your wife, why the heck would you want to name yourself that? That's a disrespectful to your wife and disrespectful to yourself and disrespectful to your son. So I'm going to say right there, dude, you got a problem. That's a psychopathic kind of thing to do. So that, no, I don't care if your manager told you you should use the word killer because it will make you more money. I'm sorry. You shouldn't say no. And the fact that he went on with that, with that title, that's, that's creepy right there. So, and then he, then he, I think he, then he uh, died of, drank too much and died. So, um, uh, oh, I could, I don't know. Um, uh, Melissa, uh, Melissa says, oh, oh, you're saying this about Sandra Cantu. Didn't the Sandra Cantu kidnapper, uh, uh, sexual assault her? Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at that case in a really long time. Um, I don't know. I thought I, I, I can't remember. I almost thought it was something else that she was doing for some reason. I'm going to have to look at that again. Um, Stephanie says, I same. I think that Kantu murder did have a sexual assault motive, as at least part of the crime. So I don't think the analysis is wrong. It's just an outlier. Mm. There was something else there. I, I, I wish I could remember. It's been so long. I'm going to look it up again. I have to do a whole Sandra Kantu video. <laughs> so this time I can get it right. <laughs> um, um, Susan Hayes, yes, that's correct. Shepard's colleague and mistress proved Shepard lied to the police. Later on, Shepard was violent with his wife number two, allegedly. See, that's, this is the problem is we have allegedly stuff. And of course, let's say he's innocent. 
And he's put in, he loses his wife to a brutal crime. He's put in prison away from his son, loses his career. Would that, could that dude become bitter and an alcoholic because he's just, his life is so screwed. I mean, I, I don't know that I can entirely blame someone for not coming out with all, all cheery, you know, as a matter of fact, interest enough, if, if a person is actually a killer, <laughs> sometimes they do come out better for him because they're like, oh, I know I did it anyway. But, you know, he was very bitter. Now, was he bitter because he was innocent or was he bitter because he thought he could get away with it and didn't? But, or maybe he just wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> you know, his family claims he's innocent. Um, his brother, um, his turns out his his mother co committed suicide after this happened. Now, the claim is that the prosecution of him caused her to commit suicide, but or did she commit suicide because she thought her son did it and couldn't live with the fact her son was a murderer? I don't know which one it is. So, yeah, there's always, yeah, who knows? That could be bitter because he failed to outsmart everyone. It's possible. Uh, they say unless you're able to really get, dig deep and have the time to go through everything. And when you're talking 70 years out, then things get really tough because by that time, there's so much added information that is, it's like a game of telephone and, and it becomes so questionable. And there's so much of it. You can't figure out what, which who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth. You know, it's like I said, when I read the first thing uh, coming out, it's like the guy had this, some of the stuff was, it just wasn't so. Um, so do you believe him or do you not believe him? Do you believe the Kirk, the first one who, who made the claim that there were two, uh, blood type C's on the wall. Therefore there was an extra person besides her blood on the wall. Do we believe it? Kirk said that she, um, the, the, she bit the guy and that, that was his blood. Do we believe him? Do we believe Tahir and his claims that he could have, you know, uh, his, his sperm might have been in her when that wouldn't have been the sperm from that night anyway. What was she was she cheating with him? Maybe, <laughs> but you know, I say it, it becomes a cluster, which I won't say on YouTube. <laughs> I will try to avoid that. So anyway, it's a it's um it's one of those cases where um, it's fascinating, but trying to come to an absolute conclusion I think is a little bit difficult. Um, but the closest I can get with what I see is there is no DNA to prove he did it, although he is the type that could do something like that. Um, there's no proof that there's a third person in the house. And his story, I, I have a real hard time getting away from his story. So if Peter Hyatt would one day do a great statement analysis on him, I'd really appreciate it. Um, but his story is just... I say not just the story, but the way all those words I pointed out in the story that just are not right. You know, it seems like he's entirely fabricating and he'd have no reason to do that. He could just tell the simple story, but he doesn't. So that makes me very suspicious of him. So anyway, I think that'll be it. I'm glad you all came back after the, the, the little uh, problem with the first round. <laughs> That's why I like doing my lives not publicly. And so I can always start over if there's a technical issue, which there was. And I changed, I changed um, servers or whatever. I changed um, browsers. I changed browsers. So maybe that made a difference. So I'm glad you all came back. I appreciate that. <laughs> so um, most, most welcome and most welcome. Oh, and thank you, Lauren. I'm, and, and thank you, Loretta. I'm, I try to break it down logically, as logical as at least we can, uh, I can under the circumstances. And I say sometimes it's difficult. Um, and that's why a lot of times people don't want to touch certain cases because they, can, they end up pissing off, you know, at least 50 to 70 percent of the people, <laughs> which, you know, this this may be one of those cases where I'm going to get an awful lot of flack that this this guy's innocent and we, we know it's Everling. And so how dare you? So it may, you know, it's one of those risky things, but uh, I'm willing to do, you know, speak about whatever cases I can. And uh, again, educational channel. So I'm just trying to show you the way I think about things. And that's what I'm hoping detectives will do. Think, be able to think these things through other profilers, students of profiling uh, and you in your regular life. When somebody comes and tells you a story like this, you might want to go, 
maybe I'll look twice at this guy. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. And I'll see you during the week um, with some more stuff. Bye.